makes the barrier for some of nature's most violent and disruptive storms. Howard's Island is Hello everybody, once again we're going to hit you up with another presidential election, this one the election of 1844, a whole new slate of candidates once again, campaigning for the White House, who's going to get it done, let's find that out right now. Now as always we're going to start off with the incumbent party and that is the Republican Party. James A. Garth had elected in 1880, but four months into his presidency, on July 2nd, 1881, Charles Guiteau, a insane character um, who was angry over not receiving a patronage appointment by Garfield, um, shoots him at a train station in Washington. Um, Garfield lingers for 11 weeks and he dies on September 19th of 1881. So his vice president, Chester A. Arthur, ascends to the presidency. And in 1884, Arthur is going to go for the full term. But he has some opposition to that nomination. Um, that opposition including James G. Blaine of Maine. Vermont Senator George F. Edmonds, Illinois Senator John A. Logan, Ohio Senator John Sherman, and Connecticut Senator Joseph R. Hawley. Now, Arthur was pretty popular within the Republican Party, and he did a couple of things in the Republican platform. He passed civil service reform, the Pendleton Civil Service Act of 1883, I believe, required government jobs to be given out on the basis of merit, mainly as a result of Garfield's assassination and the events leading up to it. And also the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed during his presidency, and that put the brakes on Chinese immigration. It was supposed to be for a period of 10 years, but it was eventually made permanent. But Arthur knew that he was suffering from failing health and he knew that he wasn't going to survive a full term, so he only makes a half hearted effort to win the nomination and instead the nomination goes to Blaine. And he's going to bring along for the ride Senator Logan as his running mate. Now that we have our Republican ticket of Blaine and Logan, let's move on to the Democrats. Now the Democrats are looking to win their first presidential election in nearly three decades. And they put out their slate of candidates as well. At the top of the list, the Governor of New York, Grover Cleveland, Delaware Senator Thomas F. Bayard, Thomas A. Hendricks of Indiana, Alan G. Thurman of Ohio, Pennsylvania Congressman Samuel J. Randall, and Indiana Senator Joseph E. McDonald. At the end of the day, it is going to be Cleveland who receives um, the Democratic nomination, although Tammany Hall um, bitterly opposes his nomination. Um, its only chance to block Cleveland was to break the unit rule, which mandated that the votes of an entire delegation be cast for only one candidate. This didn't happen, and so Cleveland wins the nomination anyway. Um, Mr. Hendricks is going to be brought along for the ride as vice president. Thomas A. Hendricks, if you will recall, was the Democratic vice presidential nominee in 1876. Now that we have our Republican ticket of Blaine and Logan and the Democratic ticket of Cleveland and Hendricks, let's put all these guys in the ring and see who's going to win this thing. Now, this campaign was marked by a whole lot of mudslinging. Um, Blaine had been prevented from getting the Republican presidential nomination during the previous two elections because of the stigma of the Mulligan letters. And the Mulligan letters came about in 1876 when a Boston bookkeeper 
named James Mulligan had located some letters showing that Blaine had sold his influence to Congress to various businesses. Um, one such letter ended with the phrase, burn this letter, from which a popular chant of the Democrats arose, burn, burn, burn this letter. And just one deal, he had received $110,150 from the Little Rock and Fort Smith Railroad for securing a federal land grant, among other things. Democrats and anti bland Republicans, these guys, by the way, were called mugwumps because they supported Grover Cleveland from a reform-minded members of the Republican Party, <clears throat> made unrestrained attacks on his integrity as a result of these letters. Now, meanwhile, Cleveland was known as Rover the Good for his personal integrity. Um, in the space of three years, first as the mayor of Buffalo, New York, and then as governor, um, he was successful in cleaning up the corruption of Timothy Hall. Um, Timothy Hall had opposed him at the Democratic National Convention and tried to prevent him from winning the nomination, but as stated earlier, it did not happen. But Cleveland um, um, was not immune um, to a mudslinging that was thrown, so to speak, in this campaign. Now, because in July, um, Republicans have found a refutation that was buried in Cleveland's past. Um, aided by sermons from a preacher named George H. Ball, they charged that Cleveland had fathered an illegitimate child while he was a lawyer in Buffalo. When confronted with the scandal, Cleveland in immediate, immediately instructed his supporters to, above all, tell the truth. So Cleveland admitted he admitted to paying child support in 1874 to a woman named Maria Crofts Halpin, um, whom claimed that he had fathered her child named Oscar Folsom Cleveland. Halpin, however, was involved with several men at the time, including Cleveland's friend and law partner. So this was taking place while he was a lawyer in Buffalo named Oscar Folsom, for whom the child was named. Um, Cleveland didn't know which man was the father. He assumed responsibility because he was the only bachelor among them. Now, shortly before election day, the Republican media published an affidavit from Halpin in which she stated that until she met Cleveland, her life was pure and spotless, and there is not and never was a doubt as to the paternity of our child and the attempt of Grover Cleveland or his friends to couple the name of Oscar Folsom or anyone else with that boy for that purpose is simply infamous and false. And as a result of this, cartoonists <clears throat> that were in favor of the Republican Party across the country really had a field day with this scandal. So Cleveland's campaign um, decided that candor was the best approach to damage control, in a sense. They admitted that Cleveland had formed an illicit connection with the mother and that a child had been born and given the Cleveland surname. They also noted that there was no proof that Cleveland was the father and claimed that by assuming responsibility and finding a home for the child, he was merely doing his duty, so kind of a right thing to do um, type of thing. Finally, they showed that the mother had not been forced into an asylum. Her whereabouts were actually unknown. Now, Blaine's supporters, as a result of this, condemned Cleveland in the strongest of terms, singing, Ma, Ma, where's my paw? However, um, the Cleveland campaign's damage control ended up working um, well enough, and the race remained a toss up through Election Day. Um, the greatest threat to the Republicans came from reformers called mugwumps. Remember, these mugwumps supported Cleveland in this election, who were angrier at Blaine's public corruption than at Cleveland's private affairs. Now, in the final week of the campaign, the Blaine campaign suffered a catastrophe. At a Republican meeting attended by Blaine, a group of New York preachers castigated, castigated excuse me, the mugwumps. Um, their spokesman, the Reverend Dr. Samuel Burchard, uh, made this false statement. 
fatal sin, excuse me. We are Republicans and don't propose to leave our party and identify ourselves with the party whose antecedents have been rum, Romanism, and rebellion. Blame did not notice Bircher's anti Catholic slur, nor did the assembled newspaper reporters, but the Democratic operative did. And Cleveland's campaign managers made sure that it was widely publicized. The statement energized the Irish and Catholic vote in New York City heavily against Blaine, costing him, eventually costing him New York State and the election. Speaking of that, let's get to the results right now. A big win for the Democrats. The Democrats are going to win their first presidential election since the election of James Buchanan in 1856. Cleveland's going to win 219 electoral votes. Blaine's only going to pick up 182. Cleveland's going to win 20 states. Blaine was 18. Had Cleveland lost New York, um, Blaine would have won the election. But that didn't happen and Cleveland won, mainly due to the anti-Catholic slur made by Mr. Burchard just right before Election Day. But it's a squeaker in terms of the popular votes continuing this pretty good streak of close presidential elections. 48.9% of the popular vote going to Cleveland and 48.3% of the popular vote going to Blaine. Um, also, this ends a pretty good winning streak for the Republican Party in presidential elections, and that is at six, um, which was tied, which is tied with the Democratic Republican streak of 1800 through 1820. So, big, big, big win um, for the Democrats and to show how close this election was um, Grover Cleveland won New York and the election by just 1047 votes so it shows how close this election was and how close the Republicans came to defeating Cleveland but that didn't happen the Democrats are back in the White House for the first time in nearly three decades. And Grover Cleveland is going to go for that second term in the election of 1888, which we'll talk about next time. And with that, I hope you got a lot out of this video. I hope you really do. The Democrats, back in the White House, everybody. Let's see how it goes. We will see you next time in the election of 1888.